I figured I would try to give you everything there is to know about autism, but we only have an hour, so I shortened it for time. Um, my name is Noah Britton. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology. I'm in Boston. Uh, I'm a counselor. I work with uh, autistic adults as a life coach, helping them get jobs or you know, deal with problems in their lives, et cetera, whatever they need. I've done research, a lot, all of it with Matt, I think. Um, I got diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome when I was 19, changed my life. I've spent uh, pretty much every year since working with people directly on the autism spectrum. I teach psychology. I work with five clients. Um, I'm also in a comedy troupe called Asperger's or Us. And I believe you all watched my TEDx talk, hopefully. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, that was 10 years ago, so I know I look far older, um, but uh, I stand by pretty much everything in it. Um, I'm going to try to give you all um, a framework that's a little different than what everybody else says. Um, or maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. And I want you, again, to try to, to be open to this. Um, I don't know the literal definition of the word autism. I'm not talking the DSM. I mean, like, verbally, linguistically. And you feel free to yell it out. I, I can't uh, hear you, so we're going to have to have repetition. But who, who can tell me this? What was that? Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, another way to think about it is just inwardly directed. Um, so if you're inwardly directed, what do you not want to deal with? I feel like you all probably know where I'm going with this. I mean, essentially, you don't want to be taken out of your head, right? You want to be able to stay in your head, and anything that takes you out of your head is annoying. This, I think, underlies all of the other stuff about autism, um, is that basic idea, is if you take me out of my head, I'm annoyed. So the hypersensitivity, I'm guessing you've heard about this already. You know, our senses are hypersensitive. Uh, we're hypersensitive to social interaction. We're hypersensitive to change. And so, you know, you go outside, you see the sun, it looks like this. I go outside, I see the sun, it looks like this. Um, how am I going to feel as I go outside? I wish I could hear everybody. That's tough. All right, thank you. Yeah, someone just yell out. How is this going to be? You're out here looking at this. I'm outside looking at this. What's going to happen? Yeah. Like, I'm going to feel bad. And the thing is, until I got diagnosed, until I learned about this stuff, I didn't know why. I just felt bad outside, and I thought I didn't like the sun. I love the sun. It's just too much for me. And, you know, everyone else seeing this, they're like, what's wrong with you? The sun is great. I'm glad it's here. And I'm like, I guess I'm not allowed to feel what I'm feeling because no one else does, and they're confused that I am. Um, I don't think this was anything anyone did wrong. It's purely just they didn't know that I was feeling this way, and I didn't know they were feeling this way. Um, and this produces so many other downstream effects. You know, that makes me not want to go outside at all because it's painful to be out there. So that's going to decrease whether I'm going to go do things outdoors, even though the heart of it is just, you know, this light difference, for example. Basically, what I'm trying to do today is sort of argue with the way the DSM configures autism and say, you know, those are common symptoms of this underlying issue of being inwardly directed. And this is the thing that pro produces all these downstream effects. Um, 
touch we're hypersensitive to. You know, a lot of us hate light touch and really like deep pressure, like hugging. We might dislike certain foods because of the texture, not the flavor, not the taste. Um, and again, that's going to cause us to be quote unquote picky about our eating habits, but it really isn't about the food. It's about the texture. You know, I'm fine with French fries, but I'm not going to eat mashed potatoes. That's a gross texture to me. And it is hypersensitive. So, you know, a lot of people have food preferences, but autistic people, we're going to have more extreme ones. Um, sound is the biggest one for me. I think for a lot of people, if your phone rings, I literally want to break it. I mean, it's just that upsetting. Um, and again, this is a situation that's going to make me unpopular socially, even ignoring all the other stuff socially. Um, if I'm in public and, you know, somebody's sitting on the bus playing music on their phone without headphones, it infuriates me. It's so horrifying to listen to this. It's so upsetting and it makes me not want to go out. It makes me really want them to stop at all costs. But if I say anything, as I have a few times, they literally threaten to murder me. I mean, that was what happened last time I did this. So I don't say anything anymore. Um, and of course, that's going to cause a lot of social isolation. If people are like, why are you so rude? What's wrong with you? Let me just listen to my music. And I'm like, yeah, but you need headphones. This is required by law for a reason. Um, the hypersensitivity gets worse sometimes, as it does for all of us. If you're feeling bad, uh, you get more hypersensitive to stuff. If you're feeling good, maybe it doesn't bother you as much. Um, if you're working on something, you're writing a paper, you're taking a test, and you hear somebody call out your name from the next room, even if they're calling out your name for a good reason or like something you'll like, you know, how does that feel at that moment? Like you're focused and then there's this person coming from outside trying to distract you. Yeah, I'm guessing pretty bad, right? That's how unplanned social interaction feels. Uh, so I'm walking down the street. I run into a friend who I like. I wasn't expecting this. I'm thinking about what's going on in my head and I see them and I want to end that interaction immediately. Not because I don't like this person, just because I don't want to be taken out of my head. I don't want to be taken out of what's going on up here, what I was planning to do, what I was thinking about. So they might see me and be like, that was real weird. He's real awkward. He ended this interaction really quick. He seemed rattled by me just being on the street and saying hi to him. Um, and that's how I am most of the time. If I haven't planned something, I'm not ready for that social interaction. So I want it to stop. You know, like I'm talking to you because I knew this was going to happen. But if, you know, it had to be rescheduled or something last minute, it would freak me out and I would do a bad job. Um, hearing our names anytime really powerfully does this. This is something I haven't seen anywhere in the literature, but I know this is true. Um, the second I hear somebody say my name, if I'm not like talking to them already focused on them, it's annoying. It feels like someone yelling your name from the next room while you're studying. Um, importantly, and I mentioned this on here, our body language doesn't necessarily show you this. Um, this is a big thing. Neurotypicals don't read body language very well. Uh, don't read autistic body language very well because it's a totally different language style. Um, I'll give you all an example. Um, this video might not work and I'll just show you two seconds if so. Um, here we have this autistic child. Hello. Logan. 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 Papa. Logan. Look at mummy. Logan. Logan. Look at mummy. Look at. All right, raise your hand if you think Logan knows he's being called on. He knows that this is his mom wanting him to look at her. What do you all think? 
I see some hands. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, he does, right? He knows. He can tell this is someone who wants my attention, but he doesn't want to look at her. This doesn't mean he's not aware of it. He's annoyed by it. He wants her to stop. Um, and she doesn't realize that that's what's happening. A lot of neurotypicals are probably assuming, oh, you know, you don't realize what's going on, so that's why you're not responding to me or something like that. Um, but he knows, and this is an example of the body language thing, where you really aren't going to naturally know this. Oops, sorry. Oh, boy. Did my computer just freeze? Hold on a second. I overloaded it. Okay, there we go. Everything clear still? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we can physically but not mentally ignore this stuff. Like, that bothered him, and he wanted her to stop. And until she stopped, he wasn't able to concentrate on what he wanted to do. But he also wasn't able to interact with her until he had the chance to finish doing whatever was in his mind. And I know this because it's happened to me so many times. Um, and sometimes I force it. I'm like, okay, I hear my name being called. Yesterday I was at work. I'm a professor. I was at work. And I got accosted before class by one of the staff people who had asked me a question about something. And it was really overwhelming. I was in the middle of lunch. I was like, oh, my God, I do not want to deal with this. I want to be in my head. This is not planned. This is super annoying. I'm eating. And I understand why she needed me. It was something she needed to know, and that was the only time she was going to run into me. Um, I wish instead that she had just emailed me, which she did anyway. I really don't know why she asked in person and then emailed. I wish she had just emailed me. But um, that kind of stuff, again, it creates these social issues that the DSM talks about. But again, underneath it all is just this basic trying to look within all the time. Um, eye contact's another one. This has been written about. This has been studied. Eye contact in everybody causes this increase in arousal, but in autistic people, it's an increase we don't really recover from until it ends. Uh, so it makes it impossible for us to listen to what someone's saying or, you know, relax in the midst of making eye contact. I hate that eye contact is something Americans think is important. You know, the only time I do it really is job interviews, which I haven't had to do in a long time, luckily. I know it's important in those situations. I can't understand anything anyone says to me while someone's making eye contact with me. But, uh, you know, I wish we were like a lot of other countries where it's not seen as important or relevant. Um, but again, that's just because it takes you out of your head. So it is very much an indicator of autism at a young age, just like that baby not responding to his name is. But I wouldn't argue these are problems. I would argue this is just indicative of the underlying issue of autism. A lot of us are hypersensitive to social interaction because people get mad at us all the time for stuff like this. You know, like this guy's not making eye contact. I called his name and he ran away. I met him in the hall and he seemed really thrown like he wanted to escape. And so we're like, okay, people are mad at me. I'm desperately working to make people not hate me and I'm super overwhelmed. And so we get scared and retreat and hide and it's tough. Um, again, it's a question of degree. A lot of people don't like conflict. That's not unique to autism, but it is something that's exacerbated uh, in autism with a lot of this stuff. Um, covered that already. Okay. so. The sensory stuff comes from that. The social interaction hypersensitivity comes from that. And then change is the other big one. I have a plan in my head. If the plan doesn't end up happening the way I see it, I'm a wreck. I don't know how to process stuff. So change is really, really hard. Um, the good news is, because there's good sides to all this stuff, while I was writing this, you know, I was listening to the same song 30 times in a row perfectly happy every time I heard it. I was like, yeah, this is great. You know, like the first time you hear that song you love, you're like, yeah, this is awesome. And then every time you hear it afterwards, it's still great. Eventually it does get tedious. I just got sick of Gangnam Style like a month ago for the first time after listening to it over and over for 10 years. Um, but finally it doesn't excite me like it used to. Um, 
Also, as you can see here, I'm making the same joke I made in two previous slides, uh, but I think it's just as funny every time. Um, it makes me laugh, particularly in this one where there's no one else in the other face hole. Uh, so an example of where maybe this isn't compatible with a lot of people, but it's bringing me joy and it's not hurting anybody. Um, one of those nice things about autism, it means I can work uninterrupted for, you know, eight hours and not think about anything else. Um, I've been researching my ancestry for the last few weeks and every night I was up so late and I was like, I have to stop because I need to go to sleep, but this is so much fun. Um, actually, you can see this. That poster uh, is me printing out all my ancestors uh, just because I was interested. I sent sent one to my parents uh, for for their selective days, and um, I'm happy about it. Something I wouldn't have done if I didn't have this intense focus that comes with autism. Um, so the hypersensitivity to change, really hard. Uh, uh, change is inevitable. You're going to run into people on the street. You're going to have things get canceled or, you know, we can't do this anymore. And it's really, 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 really tough. But um, eventually you recover. Um, in the moment, though, we might retreat further inwards for safety, and it might make us more autistic, essentially. You know, I'm retreating from the world outside because this is overwhelming. Um, stimming is something everybody does. You know, I'm sure Matt covered this. This is not unique to autism at all. People rock back and forth in a chair, or tap their foot or something when they're feeling nervous, and autistic people do it in this specific way that... I think is probably due to some hyper flexibility that might be genetic um, on, in my case anyway. But in the case of a lot of autistic people, we might be stimming in a way that looks really different than it does for a lot of other people who are stimming. But it's the same idea of just, I have a lot of energy and I need to get it out and I can't get it out. And if I don't get it out, I will feel really bad. So I have to get it out. So I'm expressing it this way where it's not about communicating but it does indicate to someone else, I am feeling a high level of internal activity. It might be activity in a pleasant way. You know, if I'm really excited, I'm listening to Gangnam Style, I'm enjoying myself, or it might be I'm really overwhelmed. There's a lot of people here and they keep yelling my name and asking me questions and I'm not prepared to be here and this is a surprise. That would be an example where I would be stimming, but for a very different reason. Um, and again, this is something that a neurotypical is going to display if they've just left a burning building or something. But autistic people are feeling things on such a high level uh, a lot more often that it comes across more often. Of course, people who get told not to stim or told not to, you know, make the same joke over and over are going to feel bad because it's like, this is me doing what makes me happy and you're yelling at me saying, I can't do what makes me happy. This is horrible. And so you might retreat further. You also might melt down. I'm sure Matt's talked about meltdowns before. Um, we might try to soothe ourselves with scripting. Um, this is part of that repetition uh, that we enjoy. You know, I hear Gangnam Style over and over for 10 years, and it's just as awesome. And I quote Kenny K. Strass Strasser over and over again, and it's just as funny every time. Um, it feels like the first time I heard it, where it's like, this is great, I love this. Um, and we like reenacting stuff, and we may not tell anyone that that's what we're doing, but like, I'm gonna take you to the same place I took someone else and do exactly the same thing and make the exact same jokes, because this is entertaining to me and it feels good to me, and you might enjoy it also, but I'm enjoying the fact that it's the same as before, just for the sake of precision, I guess. Um, When we melt down or any of this stuff bothers us, we might learn helplessness. Um, I'm not very emotionally expressive. And I think that's because when I was young, I didn't know what I needed and no one else did either. So I didn't think, you know, when my mom was vacuuming the wood floor that 
I was allowed to leave the room because I would yell and be like, stop, that sounds horrible. And she'd be like, what, what? And I was like, oh, I guess this isn't a valid complaint. Um, and it's not that she did anything wrong. She just truly had no idea what was going on with me. And I didn't realize this is not normal or not common. So I took all those feelings and I kind of just kept them inside and said, all right, I feel bad. I'm not allowed to communicate it. I'm not allowed to ask for help. I'm not allowed to protect myself. And so we learn helplessness. We get depressed. We get very cold seeming. Um, when of course it still feels really bad, but you don't express it. Um, so, and I'll take questions in a minute. I'm almost done with this sort of summary. In situations where you're dealing with autistic people who are upset, um, you really have to go through this hierarchy. Matt taught me this actually. Uh, this has been common practice for about 50 years in the autism field and it's not talked about enough, but it really is one of the few things from long ago that's still true is there's this hierarchy of intervention. You know, why are you mad? Is it sensory? Is it unexpected change? Or are you just confused? So like, you know, is someone's phone going off or somebody whistling at the wrong pitch or something like that's going to freak me out and make me want to escape. Is it unexpected change? Like somebody says, okay, tomorrow, instead of doing what you expected, we have to go to the doctor. And when I was a little kid, my mom would spring this on me and I would really freak out at her. And she'd be like, why do you hate this? And I was like, well, it's because you didn't tell me uh, far enough in advance. Um, and the last one is confusion. And so this is a big part of the social stuff. We don't know what other people's intentions are a lot of the time, because again, we're thinking about what's in our own heads, not so much what's in your head. Um, so for example, I was working with Matt actually at the camp that he founded and one of my campers, uh, we were in the pool. One of my campers swam over to me. He's like, no, these guys are being really mean. And if I were a bad counselor, I would have been like, guys, stop being mean to him. But I was like, okay, wait a minute. What, what's happening? What are they doing that's mean? And he's like, they're splashing me. And I said, okay, so if they're splashing you, it's because they want to play with you. And he instantly switched from being ready to like get really upset and you know, tell me to get them in trouble to he just walked over and was like, oh, I want to play. And then they splashed each other for a little bit. And that level of confusion that requires a concrete translation, that was the thing I was the best at at camp. And that was something I think is really, really important for a lot of us is understanding concretely what's going through other people's heads. That's why I studied psychology is and particularly social psych is my favorite thing um, because it explains all this weird neurotypical behavior that seem very weird, just counterintuitive to me. So other than self injurious behavior that comes from pure, like neurological um, strain, not due to the environment that does happen. There are autistic people for whom it's, their neurons are firing in this way, you know, people who are really prone to seizures have this too, where it's your neurons are firing in this way where it's making you want to hit your head and it isn't about your environment at all. Other than for those people, I'm going to say pretty much all of the meltdowns you're going to see in autistic people are caused by one of these three things. Um, so obviously for light sensitivity, I wear sunglasses and hats every day, all day. I have my headphones in all the time, uh, unless I'm teaching, uh, and that helps with the noise quite a bit. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people are louder than my headphones and that's when I need to leave, or maybe I can't control myself and yell at them and that doesn't ever end well. So usually I try to leave. Um, my least favorite thing is having my range of motion restricted. So if I get something caught on something as I'm walking, I'm furious. I mentioned this in the TEDx talk, but, you know, look around for stuff that's maybe getting somebody caught or there's tags in their clothes, that kind of stuff. Um, and teaching us we're allowed to leave, you know, that's something useful. I didn't know. 
just, yeah, you can go if something's bothering you. It, it feels obvious in hindsight, but when you're 10 years old, you don't know this is an option. Um, and for social interaction, plan, you know. I love it when people are excited to see me. When my friends want to see me, it's great. But if they show up at my door and I'm not expecting them, that's very weird, as I think it would be for a lot of people today. But similarly, if I run into someone on the street or maybe I'm hanging out with them and I expect them to be there for three hours and they stay longer, it feels weird. And I'm like, I didn't plan for this. I need to go be by myself and get more time in my own head. Um, and for change, reminding people in advance over and over again, you know, just remember tomorrow we do this. Okay, in three hours we do this. Okay, in five minutes we do this. Okay, in one minute we do this. That level of reminding over and over again for stuff they're not expecting uh, is incredibly helpful. And yeah, trying to explain stuff concretely. Abstraction is the worst, you know. There's no advice that's more useless than behave yourself, right? I mean, that gives you no information. And autistic people hear it all the time, but they don't know what it means. So, you know, you have to say stuff like, don't talk again until the movie is over. Or when you hate yourself, it makes me sad. One of my professors in college was telling us the story of how he worked with an autistic guy at a institution. This is a long time ago. And the guy kept hitting himself in the head over and over. And all the staff were mystified of what to do. They put helmets on him and it didn't work. And he wasn't speaking. He didn't speak. But one of the staff who really got along well with him I was like listen when you hit yourself it makes me sad and he understood you know receptive language is usually better than productive language particularly with non-speaking autistic people receptive language can be excellent so the staff person was like when you hit yourself it makes me really sad um and he stopped this was the thing that he needed just to understand wait a minute they don't want me to do this and it seems really obvious, like they put a helmet on me, but you don't know why they're putting the helmet on you. You have no concept connecting this behavioral change to a cognitive one. So he stopped just from realizing, wait, people don't want me to do this. Um, so, um, yeah, some other stuff. I'll get to that in a little bit. But questions, I've been talking for a long time. No, that was dense. And I am sad I cannot hear. Yeah. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, good question. I mean, it's not so much about doing specific stuff as it is just having in the back of my head, this is what will happen later. I do it for literally everything I have to do. So for this, like last night, I was up till, I don't know, midnight or something, researching my ancestors for fun. And then I got tired and then I was going to bed. And as I was going to bed, I'm in this habit, which has been true for years since I was in grad school where every night I'm like, what do I have to do tomorrow? And not like I'm worried about it, but just like, I need to remember when I get up, this is what I will be doing. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna be teaching this autism class with Matt tomorrow. I hadn't prepared, by the way, I had, I've done this so many times, but I hadn't prepared before that. I was just like, all right, tomorrow I will prepare. I will wake up and I will prepare. And so I woke up and I was like, what am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm gonna eat breakfast and I'm gonna prepare for this. So I searched through my slides and I was like, okay, this will be good. This will suit this. I went through them, practiced, and I was like, okay. At 2.20, I was like, all right, I will be ready for this thing. I check my calendar often. Um, my calendar is my best friend. Everybody needs a calendar, but particularly those of us who can't handle surprises. Uh, so I'm like, all right, soon this will be happening. I'm ready for this. I'm in the mental zone. You know, it just takes time of thinking about like, this will be what I'm doing. I'm prepared. You know, yesterday a friend came over and I was like, okay, he'll be here at this time. I know he will be here at this time. I need to remember I'm in the zone of dealing with him, not in the zone of researching my ancestors all morning. Um, 
and that's really the thing is just just knowing what to expect and it was great i had a good time great question anything else okay yeah The bad making you run around, but it's also kind of funny. <laughs> Someone in the back ask a question. Oh, good question. I actually work with a client on this. So like a lot of you, I can't concentrate when somebody talks for more than two seconds. Like I realize it's impossible to listen to me while I'm going off on and on. So that's why I tried to keep that kind of short. Um, cause yeah, I have to remain active in order to stay focused. Um, when I was in college, when I was in grad school, learning all this stuff you're learning, um, I just started writing jokes for stand up during class and I did this whole stand up set of psych jokes uh based on what my professors were teaching and I I did that set for years that was fun um taking notes is helpful if you're having trouble concentrating one of my clients uses a stress ball it's just anything that's like that requires activity on your part um really helps with the concentration and so Maybe it's, you know, you're typing notes, maybe you're writing stuff, maybe you're just drawing aimlessly. You know, it's different for everybody as to what they like, but, you know, it's impossible for me to do things like listen to podcasts because it's so passive. I literally can't sit through one for more than maybe three seconds because I get so bored, um, even if I really want to learn what's in it. So, yeah, it's... It's a good question, and I appreciate you all bearing with me. Other questions? I saw some hands. Yeah. Mm hmm Great question. Um, so important to differentiate between just the biological neurological stuff that's not based on your environment in contrast to things where you know you're overwhelmed by sensory stuff so you know if you're overwhelmed by the sensory stuff get them out of there etc but if it is that pure biological aggression or a uh, biological burst of neurological activity it's the hardest i mean it's it's why the judge rodenberg center exists you know they aren't handling it right but that's what it's for is people who no one has figured out how to help them. One big thing um, in that moment is giving somebody space so they're not hurting anyone else. If they're in a situation where they are harming themselves, you do have to think about how do I help this person not hit themselves in a physical way? Because probably if you're at that level of just pure neurological attack, verbal stuff isn't going to work at that moment. And you might have to... Um, I'll give you an example. I worked with a kid, one of me and Matt's old campers, and he was great, but he definitely had this neurological compulsion to put pressure on stuff. So he constantly was like poking people and not hitting them in an aggressive way on purpose, but he'd just be touching them and it would annoy them and it would start fights. <laughs> And so one thing Matt and I did was giving him soothing stuff that like we would give him things to squeeze really hard. And he was smart enough that he was able to know, okay, this is to help me and I'm going to like this. Um, if you're dealing with someone where they can't even figure that much out, you might have to just put something in their hands instead of letting them punch themselves in the head, you know, put something in their hands and let them hit that or alternately put some pressure on their skull if that's the thing they're looking for. Not something like, um, you know, squeezing it, but maybe something kind of like Temple Grandin's hugging machine. And again, for that population, that's the hardest. That's the one no one has solved um, exactly what the right thing to do is. 
But yeah, for the other people, if it's, you know, environmental, you know, first thing is get them out of there. Second thing is give them something that's sensorily soothing and then give them the space to really express how they're feeling as much as you can. Great question. Other questions? Thought I saw another hand earlier. How's everybody feeling about the course? Has Matt done a good job so far? He's great. Good. I love Matt. He's a, he's a good professor and he taught me more than anybody. He's not perfect as none of us is, but he's awesome. Um, all right. I'll cover a couple more things, just general stuff and feel free to ask questions as you have them. Um, so one of my biggest problems with places like the Judge Rotenberg Center is that they're trying to use punishment as a teaching tool, which is less effective on autistic people than on neurotypicals, because we don't understand the connection between how we're being treated and our own behavior. So if you're trying to punish me, whether it's through shocking me like the JRC does, or if it's something like you're not talking to me anymore, I don't understand that this is due to something I did. So you might ignore me for five years and I will just feel bad about the fact that you haven't talked to me in a while and have no clue why you're doing it. And then maybe I ask you about it someday and you're like, oh, it's because you said that awful thing. And I'm like, I had no idea I said anything that made you upset. And I had no idea that you were ignoring me because of something I'd done. And so punishment is the worst way of training us. Um, incidental learning doesn't work well. This is a picture of my actual brain. Um, this is my cerebellum. You can see it's got this giant black area where it's not there and it should be. Um, incidental learning doesn't work very well on us. It's also why my coordination and balance are terrible. Um, but so practice is not very effective unless we're doing it in such a way we're like, I'm trying to figure this out. Figuring out stuff, very helpful. Telling me to just practice without any understanding, no benefit. I can shoot baskets for six days and be just as bad as before if I'm not consciously trying to improve how I figure out how to shoot baskets. Um, social norms are not motivating. So other people might try to put social pressure on you and you're like, I literally don't care what you want me to do. I don't know why you would want me to, why you would expect me to care what you want me to do. It doesn't make sense. So a lot of us look terrible because we don't care and we aren't thinking about it. This is a picture of me in college. I had a really bad haircut. It's still not great, but it's better than it was. Um, it took somebody telling me, you need to look better. You need a better haircut because if you don't get a better haircut, uh, no one's going to like you. And the only reason I listened was because this was someone I had a crush on. And that was the only motivating factor to change my behavior. And it sucks that that's true. I wish it weren't, but that's often how it is. If you're someone whose opinion I value, I'm going to listen to you. But if you're just some random person, even if it's like my grandmother or my parents, I'm like, I don't know why I would listen to what you're saying. It doesn't jive with what I want. And people are like, that's terrible. That's so rude and inconsiderate. And I'm like, but that's what I have to do. This is how I need to live to be happy. Um, and so, yeah, finally, I was like, I need to look a little better. That makes sense. Um, a lot of us look terrible also because we're thinking of life in terms of my perspective only and not in terms of what you see at all. So it can be very hypocritical. I see autistic people all the time being really harsh judges of how other people look and then they look worse than all of them. And they're like, yeah, but I just dress for function and I'm like, well, your standards aren't fair. Not everybody does this, but it happens a lot. Um, if we're able to figure out stuff on our own, that's how smart we are. So I was given the chance to do this a lot growing up. I'm really glad we had a gifted program where I could really solve things on my own. I was given challenges to figure out and I was able to solve them and it made me so much smarter. 
in contrast to, you know, someone telling me what to think, and that really didn't work. Um, so this makes some of us have real problems in school. We might love learning, but we're not learning through implicit instruction at all. It doesn't help us. So explaining goals and letting people get there themselves is pretty helpful. A lot of us have the systematic brain, not always, but it is certainly more common in autism than anywhere else. Part of this is that I don't want to deal with change. I want a system that will be perfect forever, and I don't want to have to think about it again. I just want it to be implemented. Sometimes this works really well. You know, I intentionally pursued a career that was interesting to me and involved me helping people. So I don't have to consciously think about how can I help someone today? I just go to work and then I feel great about what I did at the end of the day. And that was a system I set up on purpose in contrast to somebody who goes into advertising or something where they have to really consciously be like, I'm going to donate my salary to charity because I want to help people. And, you know, I'm grateful. I don't have to think about that because it would be too much like um, change, too much consciously changing. We're a lot slower to make inferences, so we make a lot less type uh, one error and a lot more type two error. And so, again, we might make bad choices, but we are terrified of making a conclusion that's wrong. We still do it, but not as much. Um, we could be experts at the things we've explored completely. Problem is, if this is not useful, you know, I know some things that are useful, but if you've explored how to stack cans, no one's going to pay you to do this. So you got to think of something else you can use this mindset for. Um, I love sharing information, obviously. That's what I'm doing right now. That's why I'm a professor. I'm lucky. It can be really annoying for people. They don't care that my sixth cousin is Christina Applegate, and I want to tell everybody because it's really interesting. I just found this out. Cool, but they don't care. And I have to remember that and consciously be like, all right, I also want to listen to what's important to you, but it's not natural. I have to force it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any other questions on any of this stuff? I realize this is dense. I don't want this to just be me babbling. I don't think we have too much longer anyway. When do we end? Is it five minutes? Ten minutes? All right, ten minutes. I can give you ten more minutes unless there's anything else anyone wants to know. It doesn't have to be on what I'm covering. Anything you want to know about autism, I'm very happy to answer if I can. Okay, that's Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. So at the camp that I worked uh, for Matt, there were these campers and, you know, it was an improv acting camp. And from the first day I met Ethan, who's in Asperger's or us, and we just clicked. It was like, wow, someone who like really gets me and I get him and it's so nice. And we just made jokes all the time. So from that, you know, and the other two guys in the troupe also I met uh, that day and it became, Matt was probably not happy about this, but my group really became more about making everyone laugh than learning about acting or any of that stuff. But it made, they, made them have a great time. And so after five years of them being in the camp, um, they got old enough, they graduated from the camp. And I was like, let's start Asperger's Rust where we do comedy for people like ourselves. And they were into it and yeah, we've had a blast. We toured 10 countries and, you know, got to for a little while <laughs> have our careers be comedians. And now I don't think we're going to do that ever again, but it was a lot of fun while it lasted. Um, and, you know, I wish that the Netflix movie had not been a Hallmark card. Um, that was not our choice. That was the guy who made the movie's choice. We were really hoping it was going to be a comedy. Um, he did a good job. It's a good Hallmark card, but it's still not the comedy documentary we expected. 
and the TV series is the same, the HBO series is the same. Um, so I wish I could say, check out our sketches, and there are some good sketches online, but not a, not as many as there should be. Anyway, sorry for the long answer. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is a good question. So there are up and downsides to not having been diagnosed when you're young. You know, I was 19, so I never knew anything growing up. So I learned helplessness. I was certainly very socially anxious. Simultaneously, I look at some of my, you know, like the guys in the troop, and they grew up receiving interventions that were counterproductive and made their lives worse. Um, Luckily, after, you know, working together enough and being in this world enough, we're able to say, okay, I, I can see this is a good thing about me. This is a thing I need to work on. Um, and we've learned a lot about how to improve ourselves. But I think it's really a double-edged sword to get diagnosed. Even today, the interventions are better than they used to be. There's still this, you know, judgment that comes from people when they hear about it. And... There's also this, you know, we better socialize you and get you to behave like a neurotypical, which is so ridiculous um, and impossible. Um, I do think there's one other good side to me not growing up with it is it didn't become this is who I am. You know, I'm Noah Britton. That was who I was before I was Noah Britton with autism. That That superseded it. When I got diagnosed, it did become for a while, like, this is me, this is all me, I'm just autism, I'm nothing else. But eventually I learned this is not all me and lots of other things. And I think that's something that happens when people get diagnosed really young, where they really see it as like, this is who I am entirely, but you're more than that. Sorry, good question. Yeah. Sure. Um, person first language was invented by neurotypicals trying to be sensitive to autistic people's needs, but identity first language was invented by autistic people saying, you know, we don't want you to think of us as broken. So we don't want you to say person with autism because you're afraid of implying that we're broken by being autistic. And so if you look at autism as a cultural difference as opposed to a disability, then identity first language is pretty reasonable and person first language would be pretty offensive. I'm past the point of getting offended. You know, I've been in this field too long. I've seen things you can't imagine. So if somebody uses it, it doesn't bother me. I'm just like, all right, you don't know any better. But yeah, identity first language makes more sense to uh, a great many of us. There are going to be autistic people who disagree, and I think that's because they're coming at it from this perspective of, I am broken, and I don't want you to see me as this broken thing first. But those of us who don't see it as a problem are like, I'm, I'm an autistic person, just like I'm an American person, just like I'm a guy. I mean, that doesn't imply anything negative about me to be any of those things. Good question. Yeah. Thank you for running so much.
Yeah. Yeah. This is a really good question. It's a double-edged sword, you know. I diagnosed myself first, and then I went to a pro to confirm it, and he was like, you are correct. Also, did you know about the eye contact thing? And I was like, I didn't even know I don't make eye contact. Thank you, professional. I had no idea. Yes, today there are more people than ever self-diagnosing, and proportionally that means there's going to be more people who are inaccurately self-diagnosing. And... The problem with this, aside from the fact that it means they're going to box themselves in or start assuming things about themselves that are not true, is people just writing stuff and saying, this is the autistic experience. It's not about being in your head. It's not about sensory needs. It's about being a really big fan of Star Trek and like being a big fan of Star Trek doesn't in any way necessitate autism. Um, so I think the research pool, the unofficial research pool, I should say, of just people writing has become very polluted with people who self-diagnose themselves inaccurately because they don't know. Again, I self-diagnosed and it was the right move. I'm glad I did it. So I think people should be encouraged to research things, but also understand that, you know, Psych 101 syndrome is real, where you hear about something and you're like, that's me. And then you hear about something else. And you're like, wait, no, that's me. Whoops. Uh, I'm not that thing at all. And that that's a normal process. It's just unfortunate. Now we have a lot of people who are really, really like vehement about it and they don't know. Um, I also think it's important for people to diagnose themselves if they've been struggling as I was and figure out, okay, this is me. But try to go somewhere where someone's going to confirm or deny it and listen to them if they say i don't think this is you maybe they're wrong they may not be perfect but it's really worth considering someone else's perspective on that's that's the only thing i have to say about it because yeah under diagnosis and over diagnosis both happening anything else Yeah, perfect timing. Thank you so much, everybody. You've been really nice, and I hope I did okay. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. And, yeah, be nice to Matt. He's 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 a lot, but he's wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to hear whatever you all decide should be on the test from this. I hope someone emails me that. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.